Well, welcome back to our study through the book of Nehemiah. In this lesson, we will cover chapters 3 and 4. And I've entitled this uh, lesson, Responding to Opposition. As I mentioned briefly in our introduction to the book a number of weeks ago, the theme of building <clears throat> is relevant for us as believers today. Namely, in that the New Testament describes believers who are living between the comings of Christ as engaged in a temple-building, kingdom-building work. As we will see in our text for this lesson, Nehemiah and the people of God faced very real opposition to their work of rebuilding Jerusalem from the rubble and ashes of the Babylonian exile. We, too, face opposition <clears throat> in various forms to our building work. And of the many things that are mentioned in these chapters, I want us to focus on two particular questions. Number one, how did Nehemiah and the people respond to the opposition they faced? Second question, what can we learn from their response? as we face opposition as believers today to the work of God. So let's dive into chapter 3. We'll spend most of our time, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in chapter 4. But in chapter 3, we have the account of the rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem. Now, just at first glance, when we come to chapters like this in the Bible, which are full of names full of uh, listed out details of seemingly minute things, um, in this case all the building details that are listed out, we often think, why is this here? Why is this even in the Bible? Is it important? And our tendency is just to skip over those sections and move on to something that uh, we feel has more substance. So how do we answer that question <clears throat> with regard to this chapter? Well, first of all, in many ways, chapter 3 unfolds what we read at the end of chapter 2 when Nehemiah responded to some initial opposition that he and the people faced. At the end of chapter 2, we read that uh, when Sanballat and the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, What is this thing that they are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, The God of heaven will make us prosper, and we his servants will arise and build. So in chapter 3, we see his servants arising and building. In other words, this, is, this chapter serves as proof uh, of Nehemiah's words and the truth of them in the face of opposition. But there are other important aspects to this itemized building list in chapter 3. One striking uh, quality is that all different types of people from various uh, giftings and vocations and skills are working together in unity. Uh, commentators have noted 41 separate groups of people mentioned in this chapter. For example, the priests are engaged in this reconstruction work, which they weren't normally uh, involved in such things, as well as others like officials, merchants, women are mentioned, whole families, parents and their children, even perfumers are mentioned as being involved in this construction work, uh, a work that uh, one would not expect um, certain groups to be involved in. So they're working together in unity. Now, one notable exception is the mention of the nobles from Tekoa in verse 5 and 27, who are portrayed in a negative light. Um, in Nehemiah 3.5, it reads, uh, and next to them 
the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. Some scholars have uh, considered it possible that considering the location of Tekoa, which was southeast of Bethlehem, that Geshem, one of the prominent opponents to Nehemiah and the people, may have had an influence on these nobles. It's hard to say for sure, but it's a possibility. But that raises a good application question for us to consider. Are we willing to stoop to labor for the Lord? Note again, perspective is extremely important for making uh, sense of these things. According to Scripture, there is nothing negative about stooping for the Lord. You know, stooping has such a negative connotation. <clears throat> Maybe a better word would be <clears throat> serving the Lord. In fact, laboring for the Lord is always a gain for the believer. It's never in vain. We read that text like 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Think also of Christ's example. He came to serve and to suffer for our sakes, though he was the very Son of God. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 uh, says as much. It says, uh, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. May we be imitators of Christ in our labor for the Lord. Not surprisingly, in the New Testament, <clears throat> we find the church described as expressing unity in diversity in their service and work of ministry. In Ephesians 4, God uh, is said to give a variety of gifts to his church for the work of ministry to build it up in unity and maturity. You know, that's, that's why we emphasize here at St. Andrew's an every member ministry, which is part of our vision. Uh, in Ephesians 4, even those who are gifted for more prominent teaching roles, like pastors and teachers, um, are said to have those gifts in order to equip the saints for the work of ministry. In other words, it's not just the pastors and the teachers who are doing the ministry, but all the saints are being equipped for ministry. <clears throat> James Montgomery Boyce uses the illustration in his commentary that uh, many churches resemble a football game played in a large stadium. He says there are 80,000 spectators in the stands who badly need some exercise, and there are 22 men on the field who badly need a rest. There's a lot of truth in that illustration with regard to the church. Also relevant to the context of Nehemiah, consider the following exhortation uh, of Paul to the church at Philippi. In Philippians chapter 1, we read that uh, you know, Paul wishes to hear of them standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. You can see the direct parallel with the situation that Nehemiah and the people found themselves in. So we need to take heed of that same exhortation and consider how we are laboring together in unity. So that brings us to chapter 4. Um which begins with a taunt, a taunt from the enemy. Let me read that. Now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and the burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Yes, 
what they are building, if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. When we see and read this type of mocking, we, we realize that God's people faced intense psychological intimidation. They were ridiculed as weak and their work as laughable. They were mocked. How does the world engage in psychological intimidation with the church today, with us? Think about all the avenues of this type of communication through media, social media, the news, entertainment, various forms of institutionalized persecution. The list could go on. You know, the people were intimidated or the intent was to intimidate them to give up their work. Consider how are we intimidated to give up our labor for the Lord in this world? Well, what's Nehemiah's response? We see this in verses 4 through 6. He prays, and he prays this, Hear, O God, hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give, up, give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt. Let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So Nehemiah prays uh, versus, you know, think about how this might be different, a different response than how we often respond to such situations. Think of how often we respond in anger, frustration, vexation, vict having a victim mentality. Everybody's against us. Uh, walking around with a a permanent sort of conspiracy theory going on in our minds, how, how we're getting uh, ripped off, how we're getting cheated and mistreated by the political system and the justice system and the, you know, all of those things, thinking that what we're experiencing is merely a political war and we are victims of that war. How much better off we would be we simply prayed and expressed all our emotions, our anxieties, our fears, our frustrations to the Lord, we'd probably be in a much better perspective and um, better place emotionally. Now, <clears throat> if, you, if we look at what he's praying and asking God uh, for, uh, some might wonder, is this legitimate uh, to pray such things? It seems very harsh and vindictive and um, out of accord, perhaps, with other scripture. Well, this type of prayer is not unique to Nehemiah. We find prayers like this in other places in scripture, and namely the Psalms. Um, these are called imprecatory Psalms, or calling down judgment and curses on one's enemies. Now, when we find such prayers in Scripture, we need to be careful to understand them in their context, not just the immediate context, but the larger context of Scripture. And we find, when we can make those considerations, we find that these are not illegitimate prayers. They're not sinful expressions of emotion. Rather, they're, they're not taking personal vengeance into their own hands. They're calling upon God, calling upon God to take vengeance as he sees fit, to execute justice when and how he sees fit. Nehemiah prays this not because the Jews were insulted, but because God's work was being ridiculed. His glory was in view, not Nehemiah's. Also consider that praying such things is really a praying according to God's word and what he has revealed according to his covenant promises. 
way back in Genesis 12, 3, the promise to Abraham included a promise to bless those who blessed him and curse those who cursed him. So God promises curse. We need to take that consider into consideration. Even the language of, of Nehemiah's prayer sort of parallels uh, what we find in Psalm 7. Listen to these words. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. So this description of how God uh, brings justice upon the wicked uh, is very much in the same vein of how Nehemiah prays uh, with regard to his enemies and God's enemies. There's other places in Scripture that we could point to that confirm this. But uh, as Derek Thomas says in his commentary, if we have problems with the idea of God's taking vengeance <clears throat> on his enemies, we have adopted a view of God that the Bible knows nothing about. So at all times, we need to make sure our prayers are biblical prayers, uh, that they are praying according to God's word. So in summary, I would say with regard to prayers like this, it is biblical to pray that our enemies be converted on one level and to pray that their attempts to oppose God and his church be thwarted and for God to execute justice on the wicked as he sees fit. We're just entrusting these things to the Lord. We're not taking it into our own hands. So I think that that is a very, very biblical way to pray, and I think Nehemiah's prayer is biblical in that sense. So then we move on to verses 7 and 8, where we get further plotting of the enemy. The opposition here is ramped up, not only in number. We have Sanballat, Tobiah. We also have the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites. Uh, so there's an increased number of opposition, but there's also an increased intensity of this opposition regarding its nature. It's not merely verbal abuse, as it was earlier, but now very real physical threat. If you take into account the geographic areas represented by these various opponents, you see that they have physically surrounded Jerusalem. Things are getting very real with regard to their opposition. What will Nehemiah and the people do? Look to verse 9. <clears throat> he prayed. He prays again. But he didn't just pray. He prayed and took action. He set a guard. Now, it's, it's hard not to be reminded of that great prayer recorded uh, in Second Chronicles 20. Uh, the prayer of Jehoshaphat, who is in a very similar situation, uh, surrounded by an overwhelming enemy. And he responded with this beautiful prayer. Um, we don't have time to go into that passage, but I would commend, commend it to you to read and look at on your own. That's 2 Chronicles 20, verses 6 through 12 wonderful prayer that, that we can use when we face opposition as well, we, when we feel overwhelmed by the enemy. <clears throat> One passing point uh, by way of application I want to make here with regard to prayer is that know this and remember this. Prayer is never a naive response to what we're facing. But it's always necessary if we are to respond rightly in a way that honors God. It's never naive. Some will 
lead you to think that. Some would uh, tempt you to think that. That, yeah, yeah, we got to pray, but we really need to do X, Y, Z. Don't fall into the trap of thinking prayer is a childish way to respond to a situation. <coughs> now, beyond one of the things I would mention in passing also, uh, though it's beyond the scope of this particular lesson, here we have an example, a concrete example of sovereignty and responsibility. Nehemiah looked to the Lord to sovereignly act in response to his prayer, and he also took action that assumed God would act. You see, his prayer did not take away from action, nor did his action take away from his prayer. Uh, they are very much connected to one another. I'm also reminded of another passage from Psalm 37, uh, the simple exhortation of the psalmist, commit your way to the Lord and he will act. And I would include in the committing your way to the Lord as prayer is very much a part of doing that, um, as well as seeking to live out obedience in our behavior. And he will act. Or think of the words of uh, Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, in verses 10 through 12, we come to sort of a sticking point with the people. You know, Nehemiah has been responding in prayer, faith, and trust in the Lord. But the people are becoming weary in the work. The people were tempted to doubt. Notice, not merely because of what their opponents were saying, but because of what their own people, the people of Judah, were saying. Consider where they focused their attention when they became weary. They said that their strength was, strength was failing and the work was too hard. They just can't do it. They were looking at themselves. They were looking at the plotting of the enemy, the danger, the potential danger that they were in. Even the Jews living nearby came to them, the text says, ten times, saying, you must return, you must return um, out of fear. In other words, they were pleading with them to, to give up this work. It's too dangerous. You're going to put yourselves in harm's way. Now, the question we need to ask is, how do we say and think similar things in our labor for the Lord? Where do we focus our attention? Where are we looking? Who are we listening to? What was Nehemiah's response in verses 13 and 14? We see, again, he took action, but not to run away or to shrink back in his faith, verse 14 he says this uh, it, it reads this um, and I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people do not be afraid of them remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers your sons your daughters your wives and your homes the proper response in the face of such fear is to remember the Lord. That is the key element in this response. That's what will give you courage to stand firm. Remembering how great and awesome he is will encourage us to, to fight the spiritual battle that we're in and the opponents that we're up against. Now in verse 15... Uh, I wanted to point out an important 
awareness um, that's demonstrated here by Nehemiah. In verse 15, it reads, When our enemies heard that it was known to us, you know, of their plottings, and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. This really provides an answer to the despair of verse 10. The answer is being aware that God was at work behind the scenes. It wasn't just their work. Just It wasn't just their resources or their manpower. God was at work behind the scenes. Now it raises the question, how, how did they know that? How do we know that? Well, praying according to the promises of God will help us in this. You know, the Word tells us what God has done, what the kinds of things He does, and what He will do. We should expect Him to be at work in and through us, in our midst, as we struggle with all His energy, which powerfully works in us, as Paul says in Colossians 1. Again, some practical application questions for us to consider. Are you cultivating an awareness of the character and activity of God in and around your life? Or do you assume that he's really not working most of the time and you end up attributing things to chance or coincidence or other earthly factors? You know, in the case of Nehemiah, they could have come up with a number of other explanations for why uh, the enemy's plans were frustrated or why they weren't able to carry them out. But because they, because Nehemiah knew who God was and that he had been praying to him about these very things, he recognized when this happened that God had done it. He was at work. You know, one common temptation of the enemy and the world in conjunction with him is to doubt what God has said and to convince us that we are on our own. It's a very real temptation and we need to fight it with the word of God and prayer. Now the rest of the chapter describes in verses 16 through 23 describes how the work continued and how it continued with a sense of expectation among the people. You know, despite all the opposition and all its various forms, <clears throat> the work continued um, while they were ready and prepared for battle at the same time. And Nehemiah, in the midst of battle preparations, reminded the people with a confident expectation. We see this at the end of verse 20. Simply, our God will fight for us. This is a powerful statement, one that would have evoked memories and, and uh, uh, remembrances of, of past deliverance of God's people in the Exodus. This was uh, what Mo Moses encouraged the people with in Exodus 14. God will fight for them. Take courage. Will you trust the Lord when things get difficult? Will you say, my God will fight for me? No matter what the opposition, to you as an individual or to the church, God will fight for us. He will fight for his people. Maybe you're in the midst of difficulty right now. in all its various forms, it's never too late to cry out to the Lord for help. He is our King. 
He defends and fights for his people. Now I want to conclude with some practical reflections based on these chapters. Um, One point is recognize that their work, Nehemiah and the people, was ultimately God's work. And their war was ultimately God's war. Now, we need to step back and ask ourselves, is that true for us? In the way that we see things, in our perspective. Perhaps we need to examine whether we are actually engaged in God's work, laboring for the Lord. And are we fighting on the wrong on the are we fighting on the right side of this war that we're in, this spiritual battle? Now with regard to opposition from the enemy, we need to avoid common mistakes. We must avoid thinking that the opposition automatically signals God's disapproval of us. On the flip side, we must avoid drawing the conclusion that a lack of opposition automatically means God's favor, when the opposite can very much be the case. What about our plight? in the world in terms of the work being involved and engaged in the work of the Lord and the building effort as I mentioned earlier I want to read a quote from J.I. Packer in his book Keeping in Step with the Spirit he makes this observation that any idea of getting beyond conflict outward or inward in our pursuit of holiness in this world is an escapist dream that can only have disillusioning and demoralizing effects on us as waking experience daily disproves it. What we must realize, rather, is that any real holiness in us will be under hostile fire all the time, just as our Lord was. And this holds true for, you know, personal sanctification, maturity of the church, but also the growth of the kingdom of God and, and people being brought into it and, and the work of missions and all the work that the Lord has for us to be a part of. This reminds me of that stark image in Revelation 12 uh, where we see that the church of God, the people of God, are being persecuted throughout what we might call the inter-advent period, the time between the comings of Christ. And before Christ returns, we have this image uh, in Revelation 12, verse 17. Then the dragon, representing Satan, became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. Who are those offspring? On those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. We can expect spiritual opposition to our labor for the Lord every step of the way. And Satan employs the world and the flesh to wage this war. As we saw with the physical opponents, uh, Sanballat, Tobiah, and others, as well as with the doubt and unbelief of the people, the flesh. The question, in light of all of this, is how will you respond to this opposition? I think we've learned much from the response of Nehemiah in terms of prayer. Prayer and, and, and acting on faith. How will you respond? Let's pray. Father, help us in our spiritual battle, in the work that you've given us to do. Strengthen us with your might. Help us to remember you, the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. 
from whom comes our help, that we may not be afraid and lose heart. May we never give up, but always trust you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.